Hello, and welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm on Count Zero. This week, we're getting to the middle of Nintendo Power's second year with issue 9 for November and December for 1989. Well, let's get started. Our cover game for this issue is the NES version of Tetris, so we get more falling block action in this issue. Unfortunately, this is one of Nintendo Power's all art clever covers, which means it's fairly weak. The cover also promises a big, epic strategy guide for Dragon Warrior, which is why I put off the review of Dragon Warrior until this issue. Unfortunately, I forgot to skim through this issue while I was reading and reviewing games for the last issue, so I failed to re realize that this copy is missing that guide, so I'll just review Dragon Warrior now and get that out of the way. Well, honestly, Dragon Warrior, though, hasn't aged well. There, I said it. Dragon Warrior is all about the grind. Like coffee. The story here is barely there. All you do is you grind until you get the money and experience to go to the next town, and then you grind some more until you can move on to the next get next town, and on and on, until you've res rescued the princess, and then gone all the way around the world, and you do have to go all the way around the world to do this, to, fi to find the Dragon Lord and kill him. Considering that the very next game in the series introduced a much more interesting story than this one, and also never mind that the story of Final Fantasy, which admittedly is, has its plot holes, is more... is more, and in, almost in every respect in terms of more engrossing, more developed, more thought out, then honestly I can't recommend this game unless you are a big fan of the Dragon Quest slash Dragon Warrior series and want to own this copy as part of your collection. If you... Actually, yeah, that, that's basically it. If you are a fan of Dragon Warrior slash Dragon Quest and you are a collector, get this version of the game. Otherwise, get Dragon Quest 1 in a compilation volume with other Dragon Quest games if you are a fan of the Dragon Warrior Dragon Quest series. If you aren't a big fan of Dragon Warrior Dragon Quest, if you want to get into the series for the first time, pick one of the newer titles. Or pick one of the newer ports of the, of the new titles, like for the Nintendo DS. Don't pick this one. That's it. And just to add to the disappointment somewhat, the letters column doesn't have anything of no. I mean, this is kind of disappointing. It's like last issue, we had a person who accidentally backed over an NES, but it still works. And then you get nothing. It, it, it's kind of sad. Oh, well. Our first actual game being covered this issue is Willow. The article gives some instructions and advice, though not the screenshot maps, um, for the first half of the game. Now, I've enjoyed some of the original art they've done for fantasy games in the past, but when they're doing maps, I prefer screenshot maps as they give me a better idea of, as I play the game, what I should be looking for. They do give a kind of screenshot map later in their big two-page spread thing, uh, fold-out poster thing, but nothing's labeled. And part of what helps is having the labels for, okay, you need to go to this place here. Um, here's a power-up that you might have missed otherwise. That sort of thing. As far as the gameplay goes for Willow, Willow's like a mix of Legend of Zelda and the Ease series. It has the grind and leveling up of Ease, and the walking around exploration of Legend of Zelda with an attack button as opposed to the running into your opponent sort of football style combat of ease. The big innovation here though is the two different types of sword attacks. You have either a big swipe which could theoretically hit multiple enemies but is slower, um, which is your default attack when you press the attack button, and then if you press the direction button in the direction you're moving while hit hitting attack, you do a quick thrust, which will only hit one enemy, but it will also be faster and let you hit more often. Uh, the controls are solid and responsive, and a particular thing I like is as you level up, in addition to gaining more magic points and more hit points, is your speed of your attack hits up. So like by the time you hit level like three or four, um, you attack incredibly fast, and actually it's the point where using turbo is a really viable option. Uh, for taking on enemies. It's it it's great. It's I like it when RPGs give you a tangible way of showing how much you've gained you improved and how, how what you've gained by leveling up as opposed to just oh the numbers are bigger now. 
that is that's really good. More games should do this, not just for like the 8-bit generation, but in general for RPGs. Next article is for Tetris, and we get more advice on how to play that. A lot of this is repeats from stuff from the Game Boy version of the game. As far as the game itself goes, it's Tetris. There isn't that much more I can say here, aside from the differences this game has from the Game Boy version, in that this is a single-player only game. The Game Boy version, you could do two-player through System Link, and I believe there's probably a way to do two-player through Super Game Boy, or stuff like that. This in of itself would be an issue, except for the fact that Tengen's version of Tetris, which was pulled from the shelves due to a big, big, messy lawsuit, had two-player, and so this game feels all the more disappointing based on what we've lost. As an aside from here on, we really won't be getting any more Tengen games in Nintendo Power. Yes, titles like RBI Baseball 2 get released, as well as the NES ports of, I believe, Shinobi and, um, like, Afterburner, or at least after this point. But, well... Honestly, the, from here on, Nintendo and Tengen slash Atari aren't on speaking terms. Um, between the whole fight over who gets the NES publication rights of Tetris, plus the whole mess of Atari trying to get around the um, DRM or the, the lockout codes for the NES, it's not going to happen. Um, yeah, these two companies no longer are speaking terms. Um, though this said, this also means we're approaching the point where we get the big Nintendo lawsuit. For those who aren't familiar with this, Nintendo, in part as an attempt to avoid the massive publication of print runs, for lack of a better term, of games from the Atari 2600, um... They limited the number of games that could be published by any public by any publisher at one time by handling cart production themselves. Um, this was also so they could would get a larger cut of the sales of games. And long story short, you were limited in the number of games you could put out per year, and you were forced into ex ex I can't speak exclusivity deals. Basically. If you were publishing your games on another console at the same time, your prior your number of games per year is limited, as opposed to those who signed exclusivity deals. So this is why, for example, when the Genesis came out, the version of Ghouls and Ghosts that came out for the Genesis, I can't believe it was Ghosts and Goblins by that point, uh, came out for the Genesis was was ported by Sega and published by Sega, with Capcom having not much to do with the actual um, design of the port. Or for that matter, why most games on the Master System, and then for the first couple of years of the Genesis, tended to be either first-party titles or titles from publishers who weren't um, putting games out for the uh, NES. This ended by the super time of the Super NES. In fact, it ended like after, like before the Super Nintendo came out, but after, um, but yet, but after the Game Boy came out. So we're coming up on this point, and there was a big lawsuit by several publishers, I believe Atari among them, saying, "Hey, this is non this is anti-competitive," and the judge ruled in favor of the publishers but required a settlement, which was basically a slap on the wrist of Nintendo, of a five do of all owners of Nintendo Entertainment Systems would get a gift certificate for five bucks off of one game. Most games were considerably more than five bucks, so either way, Nintendo is getting money out of this. Um, so there's that. And ultimately what this leads to in terms of Tengen is the era of the black cartridge. If you've ever been in a mom-and-pop game store and you've looked at the racks of NES games, you've seen these black cartridges there. Oh, those are those are bootlegs. They are, or they're not licensed titles. They are, but they aren't terrible titles. We're not talking like 
a Action 52 or a um, or an, it's any sort of collection of Bible games. We're talking about games played by Tengen, often ports of Namco or Sega titles, who which are licensed as far as from their publisher from the original game de- developers, but not licensed with the Nintendo because. Because, well, Atari got, took steps to get around the lockout restrictions. I recommend reading the book, the um, Game Over, The Ultimate History of Video Games. It is an excellent book. It's a long book, and it covers everything. But it, it's worth reading. Um, they also cover this some in... No, no, The Ultimate History of Video Games isn't Game... No, it is... Yeah, Ultimate History of Video Games is Game Over. There's another book also titled Game Over, originally, about Nintendo... Um, which uh, I'll put the links to the books in the show notes. I've actually reviewed both of them on my um in the written reviews on my blog, so let's put links down there so you can view them at your heart's desire. At, at your heart's desire, I believe both books are available on the Kindle as well. If you prefer to read your books in that fashion, or because you don't have enough room on your bookshelves for more actual books, so. Moving on. We have a new installment of Howard and Nestor even earlier in this issue. This time, Nestor is venturing into the world of DuckTales, but without any connection to either the animated TV show or the works of Karl Barks or Don Rosa. That's kind of weird, considering how well the artist kind of got into the headspace, for that matter, for lack of a better term, of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for that strip. Um, to be fair, the art in this magazine is handled by Nintendo of Japan, and it's entirely possible that the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles had more exposure in Japan than the Uncle Scrooge comics did, which are a little more successful in the West, particularly Europe. Next up is Super Off-Road. I'm sorry. Ivan Iron Man Stewart's Super Off-Road, which is a mouthful of a title. We have a brief description of the game and that it supports multi-tap. The article also pretty much states up front that the game only has eight tracks, which repeat with variations of where the power-up items are, and with the, of course, the old classic trick of mirroring the track as well. But sometimes they don't even do that. Unfortunately, from a gameplay standpoint, this is not a satisfying racing game. The camera is zoomed so far out that it makes controlling the vehicle difficult, particularly for doing semi-precision things, or things to become precision in this game because of the camera angle, like maneuvering around obstacles in the track. Worse, more than a few times, I lost track of which vehicle's mine. Uh, The only way to tell is by color, which means if you're colorblind, you are absolutely screwed. Only having eight tracks also makes this game very, very repetitive. Reversing the direction to go in the track and changing the power-up location only does so much. I can't recommend picking this game up for any reason. Even if you want to play a, this game multiplayer, the zoomed out camera angle will make it difficult to tell who was playing what car, leading to confusion. We also have an article about the sequel to Wizards and Warriors from Rare, appropriately titled, titled Iron Sword of Wizards and Warriors 2. This game has elemental themed levels, but without the heavy princess rescuing from the last game. Also, the art for this article feature, um, reflects the shift in the series for the covers leading to more Fabio-style barbarians, as opposed to guys in shining armor, which is what the main character of this game is. The game itself, however, needs someone to come to its some gameplay rescue. All the problems from the first game are here in spades. Your attack rate is ineffective, the hits, cheap, the hits come fast and furious and are cheap, the platforming is awkward, there's just nothing good here. There's a reason Rare never, ever considered re-resurrecting this franchise for any system. It never got brought back on the Super Nintendo. It never got brought back for the Nintendo 64. It never got brought back after the 8-bit generation. Honestly, if there's any title in Rare's back catalog, which I suspect they still own, that's worth resurrecting, it'd be RC Pro-Am, and even then, there are so many other kart racers out there that have upped the ante so much that I can't see Rare resurrecting it unless they do RC Pro-Am as a kart racer with other Rare characters, like Conker and Banjo and the knight from Wizards and Warriors 
driving around in circles kind of thing. Nintendo Power does an article where they give a bunch of spoilers for the conclusions of various Nintendo games, which doesn't mean much because most of the games they cover here are games with very short cutscenes at the end of the game. So it's not like there's an actual real spoiler there. It's, yeah, whatever. The Robocop strategy guide continues with maps for stages 2 through 4 of the game. I'm not going to review this, though, because I've already reviewed this game. Then, next up, is we get NES Play Action Football. We get a rundown of, of this game, more in-depth than the one we got last issue, including notes on how to do well at football, which is good if you're not a fan of football, and notes on the various teams. The game was made with the license of the NFL Players Association, so that means that San Francisco, Miami, and Denver are all gods at the passing game, because you got they got um, Joe Montana, they got Dan Marino, and... I used to know who the famous quarterback from around this time of the Denver Broncos was, but it's completely left me. So, anyway. Um, however, they, while they can use the cities for the various teams, they can't actually use their logos, though they try to work the colors in. Gameplay-wise, though, this game has, has problems. Players in this game either get you massive yardage or a massive setback, with, like, the exception of running. Successful passes tend to get you minimum a 15-yard gain, which means a first down. And if you're tackled, that's if you're tackled immediately, by the way, once you catch the ball. If you manage to get a run in, you can get up to like 75 yards in here, at both you as the player and as in terms of the AI. And that can take you from a touchback to a goal line situation in one play. Maybe not exactly a goal line situation, but pretty close. Um, on the other hand, running plays tend to be a little more realistic in their yardage games, usually usually being useful if you're wanting to push for the couple yards you need to convert a second and two or whatever and two into a first down. However, if your team has good running backs or tight ends, you can sometimes manage a breakthrough for massive yardage, but otherwise, with all the massive benefits you get for successfully hitting a pass, it's often better to go with passing plays, particularly if your team has a good quarterback. But this leads to the problem with passing plays. You don't pass to receivers past directions, left, right, or center. After the ball's in the air, you switch the control of whatever receiver is going to be closest to where the ball is going to land and try to get them in the right place. The problem is, though, the game shows the field when you're doing passing in a zoomed-out perspective and with the field at a 45-degree angle on the screen. This means that the only receiver you can see if they're open is the one on the left. The other two are off-camera. So, consequently, if you're throwing to them, there's a good chance that you'll end up either incomplete or worse, having an interception. Thus, the only way to go is to the left, and everything else being a crapshoot. Crap Which also means, if you're actually playing against another player, they can more accurately defend because they know which receiver to go to. Or with defense on. It's, yeah, it's a mess. Next up is an article talking about the new Power Glove and U-Force controllers from Mattel and Broderbund. Honestly, the angry video game nerd did a better video on these than I did, than I, than I could do, um, both really to the cost of these peripherals and various other things. So I'll just put a link to his video in the show notes. We get a whole big rundown of upcoming titles in the winter release period. Um, a lot of these are shovelware. We have... The Jeopardy Jr. and Wheel of Fortune Jr. game is from GameTag. We have a Three Stooges minigame collection. The only other two here where I could possibly see doing a full guide, a guide about a review of them in the future if they do more coverage later, has a flight sim called Strike Eagle and a Godzilla game. In the Game Boy section, though, we have a semi-feature on the first, well, Mario game for the Game Boy, Super Mario Land. And we get maps for the whole first world of the game, and so let's just let's talk about that. From a gameplay standpoint, Super Mario Land is inferior to Super Mario Brothers, which is the Mario game it tries to emulate the most. Honestly, the game gets a lot of its feel just terribly wrong. If you jump on turtles, instead of getting a shell you can kick to take out enemies, the shell explodes after a few seconds, which means you have to move. Um, and that there's no risk-reward ratio there of jump on a turtle 
and either move on and the turtle grows back later, or jump on a turtle, kick it, get to kill a bunch of enemies, but risk getting taken out yourself. That sort of thing. Um, the fireballs are also strangely useless, in that they bounce off of whatever they hit at a 90 degree angle, and they, they descend at a 45 degree angle like in the game, like in the original game. So it's like, they bounce once and fly off of the screen unless there's other blocks and stuff in the way. It, it's weird. It It's weird and it makes aiming it difficult and it just makes it makes the Fire Flower, which is one of the most useful power-ups in the game, considerably less useful. On further, the other thing is the sprite for Mario doesn't relate to the sprites for the blocks and both, both question blocks and the blocks you break um, as well or in the same way that he did in the NES game. He's bigger than the question blocks and the sprites for the power-ups like the Fire Flower and Mushroom are much smaller. So it, it, it visually doesn't quite work well either. It's like Nintendo didn't quite get how to handle the graphic stuff for Mario on the Game Boy before they made this game, and rather than taking the additional time to get it right, they just felt, we have to have the Mario game at launch, we'll worry about doing the visual style right in the next game. It's it's, it's a really weird curiosity of a title. If you're a Mario fan, definitely worth picking this up, or if you're just... If looking at the gameplay footage here has you go, huh? That also definitely would make it worth checking out in that regard. As far as other Game Boy games go, we get little glimpses, as far as screenshots, of the pinball game Revenge of the Gator and Castlevania the Adventure. I may take a look at those later if they get featured coverage, but otherwise, I don't know. Maybe if they show up in the top 30. In the actual previous section, we get a look at the adventure game Shadowgate. This is basically the NES's first point-and-click adventure game, and it's also one that's kind of pixel-bitchy and has a fair amount of cheap deaths to it. Let's also look at Silent Service, which I believe is the first Sid Meier game to get a console release in the United States. The art has a the article has great art of a U.S. submarine coming out of the water, and actually, actually, I'd really, really like a print of that painting for my wall. So this article of um, of this particular issue of Nintendo Power, the Silent Service preview, has kind of clinched it for me. It's I've now kind of realized the four defining traits of Nintendo Power in terms of art style and layout in order of significance as far as what is important and what wor- and what really works as opposed to stuff which oh, plenty of other magazines did around the same time. First is the screenshot maps. Up to this point, I hadn't really seen any sort of, any of these sort ah, any of these sort of elaborate screenshot maps of the levels of a game. Even games that you wouldn't think would need screenshot maps, like Brawlers, got these big maps going running across two pages of where every power-up is labeled, where, where it's located, where the enemies are going to spawn. It's excellent. Um, the second is oil paintings, like the ones that we had here for... Um, with Silent Service, and for some of the stuff we had earlier with Dragon Quest. Some of these came from the actual box art for the games, because I believe the Operation Wolf um, oil painting came from them, came from the developers and the official art, but some of them weren't. The art for Dragon Quest clearly is not official art. This, the official art is the... well, kind of official because it was published by Nintendo, and the art was made by Nintendo, but May, but most of the art what, um, that you get, original art in Nintendo Power, isn't from the publisher. It's not from Enix. It's not the Akira Toriyama art, or anything like that. However, this art is still incredibly evocative, it is incredibly well done, and it's actually the kind of thing where... It, it's stuff that you wouldn't mind hanging on your wall. It's not... If it's fantasy art, it's not pin up fantasy art. It's not Frazetta, it's not... Vallejo, not to knock Frazetta and Vallejo, Frazetta, um, they both, the two, they create evocative and interesting images for their fantasy art. I don't mean just like in terms of titillating, but 
titled The Painting of the Death Dealer by Frazetta is one of the most iconic pieces of fantasy art of all time, and there's no nudity there at all. Um, but still, the art intended power isn't like Frazetta's Death Dealer. It's almost closer to Larry Elmore in terms of the style of fantasy art, but it's, and it's well executed, and it's, again, it's something where if you hung it up on your wall, it wouldn't be too tacky. You'd have to be a certain degree of tackiness, but not too bad. And in other cases, like with the uh, painting for silent service of the submarine coming out of the water, it would fit gorgeously on the wall. And it's like, oh, you like submarines, or oh, you had found the navy, or whatever. And it's it, it, it's a perfect, not say perfect piece of art, but it is a excellent, excellent piece of art. Um, the third is Howard and Nestor. Not just because it's the uh, Nestor was the mascot for Nintendo for quite some time, and Howard Phillips was, well, the face of Nintendo, the, the real face of Nintendo as far as gamers were concerned, for quite some time through Nintendo Power Magazine, but because of how the magazine managed to, in some ways, expand on the world of the various games in a tongue-in-cheek fashion, and convey cheats and tips for various games in a clever and insightful manner, not insightful, but clever and useful manner, through a different art, through a different fashion than a dot on a screenshot map with a label leading off of it. It's, it's a good way to teach people things. There's a reason why, nowadays, if you go into bookstores, you're seeing all these manga guides to X, manga guide to making databases, manga guide to physics, manga guide to mathematics. I'm surprised there isn't a manga guide to car maintenance. Um, because you can use artwork um, to and, and graphic art and comic art to convey information in a very useful and entertaining fashion for both um, for the reader. So they learn something, they've also got something I've also Cartoon History of the World of Computing by Larry Gonick, and there's a, sim a similar one for uh, history as well. So, giving ideas here of of that that Nintendo power through Howard and Nestor was on, let's say on the edge, but well, was on the cutting edge in terms of a, using new ways to convey information. The fourth and final of these artistic elements that really work for me and defines Nintendo Power, at least at this point, is the cover dioramas. Most game magazines, they use official art from the publisher. Occasionally they'll come up with their own stuff. But usually it's 2D line and, line and ink. Or line ink and coloring. <clears throat> Which, nothing wrong about that. It's It works. But Nintendo Power takes it up to the next level through the use of dioramas. And yes, diorama is the thing we all built in grade school. Build your diorama about the Gettysburg, about the pioneers crossing the Oregon Trail. Maybe you guys back east probably didn't do so much about the Oregon Trail. We did a lot of that in Oregon. Um, all this, um, all the sorts of stuff. Dioramas. It, it's the fixture of your of your grade school social studies class. Well, Nintendo Power takes it and implements it in an excellent fashion for talk for encapsulating what's New Zelda, for encapsulating track and field, um, all these other sorts of games on their covers where where honestly some people would go, oh we'll just do a draw a drawing or take some official art from the publisher and that'll work. Nintendo says, no, that's not enough. we got to just think more. Why use a drawing when a photograph can do something even more interesting? We can do some photography and props and stuff to make things even more interesting. I mean, sometimes things fall flat. The Ninja Gaiden cover was not very good. The Zelda cover was iffy. But everything else was great. Everything else we've seen thus far has been amazing. And I look forward... As for every issue of Nintendo Power, as much as I look forward to the articles and the games that are covered inside, I also look forward to the covers. They are just 
excellent. They have some of the best covers in any video game magazine of all time, short of Modern Game Informer. And even then with Modern Game Informer, oftentimes some of this art is official art assets, but it's still gorgeous, captivating, and honestly, in some of these, some of these cases, I've vaguely considered picking up um, the posters from the GameStop store. So, anyway, that, so moving on from the art, my, and my gushing. We also get looks at the NES versions of A Boy and His Blob and 720. There's one more feature article with a look at the Guardian Legend, which entered the top 30 list well, last issue, and we get maps of the first four labyrinths. The Guardian Legend plays like a mix of a shoot 'em up and The Legend of Zelda with guns. The game is divided into labyrinth sections and corridor sections. The labyrinth sections are the Legend of Zelda part. You walk around the map using your weapons to take on enemies and collecting power-ups and chips, which you use to power your special weapons. Maxing out your chips powers up your primary blaster, and you can increase your maximum amount of chips by collecting items called Red Landers on, in various labyrinths. In these sections, you also can shoot in eight directions, which makes this ideal for controllers like the NES Max or the NES Advantage. I didn't find much of a gain from using Turbo Fire here, and in particular there's a Rapid Fire power-up in the first labyrinth, which basically lets you fire really fast while holding down the button normally. So, again, you don't get much out of it by using the, the Turbo Fire, so don't worry about it if you don't have a Turbo Fire controller. Honestly, the 8 direction bit is more useful, in my opinion. The corridor sections, on the other hand, play like, well, shoot 'em ups And you use your weapon upgrades and special weapons you've picked up during the uh, labyrinths through here to defeat the various enemies and the, and the boss for each section. And these give you keys that let you access new areas. In turn, you can backtrack between the various portions of the game as you increase your uh, chip cap to get items that you couldn't have afforded otherwise from the various shops in the game. Consequently, this game is an absolute blast to play, and I definitely recommend picking up this game if you can find a copy. In Counselor's Corner, we have a question about how to beat the tougher enemies in the in RPGs. Well, grind more, use buffs, but that's pretty much what you do. In Classified Information, we have a cheat, or rather an exploit, that you can use to get a whole bunch of money in Faxanadu which I'll have to use to next time I play the game. Uh, basically, you spend all your money in the first town, go back, um, get more money from the king, and wash, rinse, repeat. But the more important cheat is that there's a way to cheese a whole bunch of one-up power-ups in Ninja Gaiden to get a boatload of extra lives in the last level of the game, which you're going to need. So this is definitely a cheat that, uh, real honestly... You need to, you need to know. You need to know. You really need to know. So I'm just gonna sit here and let you look at the cheat while I kinda talk a bit. Okay, you've had a good chance to take a look at it. Just in case, favorite this video or whatever, come back here, pause this frame, and just look at this. Look at it. You need to know this. If you're playing Ninja Gaiden. Moving on. Speaking of Faxanadu, in the top 30, it has entered the list, along with Dragon Warrior and Strider, giving us three new games to the list that I have reviewed previously. On the list of games that I haven't reviewed previously, we have Baseball Stars, Dr uh, Double Dragon 2, and the strategy game Nobunaga's Ambition, which I don't think has been mentioned much in the magazine, also joining the list. In the video shorts column, we learned that SNK has a rush and attack style brawler called POW that is coming out. In the NES journal column, we learned that Capcom has started setting up video game kiosks in the pediatric wings of hospitals. Yay! The, also the 1990 Nintendo World Championships are going on, starting a tradition of, well, not starting a tradition, it started earlier. So we have the Continuing a tradition of video game tournaments that would test the width of players' skills in, in terms of on a variety of games as opposed to their breadth of skills, like setting the top score on Donkey Kong, if you've seen the movie King of Kong. Um, we also can look at the movie The Wizard, including a somewhat spoiler of the film's climax, where 
the final game in the tournament is Super Mario Bros. 3. And thus, in turn, giving film goers their first chance to actually see the game in action. Tying in with this, we have a celebrity profile of Fred Savage, one of the stars of The Wizard. Um, in the Where Are They Now category, Savage is still actively acting in film and television, and he's also directing TV shows. Um, so, good for him. Packwatch column has more info on Super Mario Bros. 3, no surprise there. Well, for my two-player pick this week, I gotta go with NES Play Action Football. We have two multiplayer games in this issue. One is playable, one isn't. And the playable one is NES Play Action Football. Straight up. If it sounds like it's damning with faint faint praise, well, that's because it is damning with faint, faint praise. The single-player front, though, things are more promising. We have Tetris. We have... We have the Guardian Legend. Oh, we have a lot of interesting games here. However, I gotta say... With Tetris... It's Tetris. It really is. This version... And and it's it's single-player only Tetris. And there are so many places you can go now to play single-player only Tetris that really I can't recommend this version of the game if you have Tetris in some other form. And odds are pretty good you have Tetris in some other form. You have it in your Facebook. You have it on your console as a downloadable game. You have it on your smartphone, your tablet. You have it on... You you may have it in on your uh, portable gaming system. If you have Tetris in any other form, don't bother with this version unless you are training for the Tetris World Championships because this is the version of Tetris they use. You're a Tetris purist. You go, okay, what version of Tetris do the pros use? Here you go. That's the version to get. Otherwise, get the Guardian Legend. It combines shump, shoot 'em ups and Legend, Legend of Zelda-style exploration in a fashion that works really well. It has a lot more going to it than, well, a lot of the other similar games like Blaster Master did. So, with that said, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe to the channel or give a thumbs up. And, well, next time, we need to put on our bat dancing shoes because our cover game is Batman. And I'll see you then.